We have your Bible. Turn with me in the book of Isaiah chapter number 59 this morning, please, and verse number 14. Isaiah chapter number 59 and verse number 14. Now, our kids will be singing tonight, and uh, this will be, uh, of course, this is Father's Day. They'll be doing some special singing for us tonight, and so please, try to be here. I know it's Father's Day, and a lot of folks will be visiting with families and cooking out and so forth and so on, but if you can be here at all, try to support the service Amen. and support the kids, Amen. because they'll be up singing for us tonight. Isaiah chapter number 59 and verse number 14. The scripture says, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Equity means fairness. So therefore, because of this, we have truth fallen in the, in the street, judgment turned away backward. I suppose of all the things that impressed me this past week about our camp is the fact that these kids had some of the best preaching that they could possibly have. The reason that they heard this type of preaching is because the truth was propagated in the camp. Truth was preached. Truth was set before them. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. You can believe a lie, tell a lie, embrace a lie. It'll always be a lie. Amen. And even though you believe it, it's still a lie. Amen. And it'll never set you free. The generation in which we live today has believed the lie. They are embracing the lie. And by believing the lie, they have embraced the Antichrist along with it. For he is the lie in opposition to the truth. The Lord Jesus Christ stands on this side as the truth of God. The Antichrist, which is the greatest man, the epitome of man. He is the, he is the wonderment of man. He is all that man ever expects to have. He stands on this side in direct opposition to the Son of God. So here in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 59 and verse 14, we have the, the fact that the truth has fallen in the street. On Monday night, Ralph Sexton preached to our teenagers. He preached to 800 and plus something teenagers. And he preached to them about suicide and drugs. He told the kids that drugs is a great problem in America. A lot of kids are experimenting with drugs. A lot of people experiment with drugs and think that they're going to find something that will be able to get them through life. And drugs will offer them something that they don't have. And drugs is a way that uh, they can enjoy life. And may give them strength and it may give them it may give them abilities that they don't or simply by taking drugs that they're able to to uh, be accepted by a certain crowd or whatever many peer pressures out there all kinds of things cause the reason for people to do things but on the bottom line is this any man that gets hooked up into drugs any woman anybody that gets that gets suckered into drugs gets suckered into a pit that they'll find no way out of Amen. except the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a drug out there today that's called crack cocaine. If you're not aware of it, you need to be. Crack cocaine is one of the most addictive things known to mankind. People that have been hooked on heroin have broken the habit. People have been hooked on most of the other drugs, any drug you can think of, have broken, have broken the bondage. But crack cocaine gets such a bondage upon people that it's practically impossible without the grace of God, the power of God, to break that bondage. The reason that these men preach to the kids the way they do is because they're warning them not to try them the first time. They are telling them that truth has fallen in the street, and it has. For indeed, many preachers stand in the pulpit week after week and condone or at least make allowances or are soft on the drug usage among teenagers. And they say that they're going to experiment, they're going to play with it, they're going to try it, and so therefore that's part of growing up. No, it's not. That's part of going down, not growing up. That's part of degeneration, not the betterment of society. That's one of the worst things you can do. But my friend, let me tell you something else. He told us about rock music. He said that rock music has, preaches a message that is threefold. Rebellion, drugs, and sex. Rebellion is shot through rock music Amen. from the beginning to the end. Amen. It teaches kids to rebel. Amen. You wonder why all of a sudden a different attitude is overtaking your child. You wonder why all of a sudden your child is no longer the same. Check the music out that it's listening to. Amen. If you wonder why your child is rebelling against you, go look at their records. Go look at the tapes. Go look at the CDs. And you'll find why your child is rebelling if they're listening to rock music. Because rock music's foundation, foundational message is rebellion. And it not only teaches rebellion, it teaches drugs. And then it teaches sex. 
Rock music is shot through with sex, illicit, fornicating, perverted sex in every sense of the word. Rock music, therefore, becomes the great pariah of mankind. It becomes that thing that men use to destroy their very image. The Bible teaches us here in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 59 and four, verse number 14, that truth is fallen in the street. Do you love the truth? Do you support the truth this morning? Do you want the truth preached? Do you embrace the truth? If you don't, my friend, truth will fall in the street. The reason that it fell in the street here is because it was preached to men. It was preached to women. But they absolutely refused to accept the truth of the Word of God. Have you a television set? Do you have cable TV? Do you have MTV, which is music television? Do you have that on your, on your TV? If you've got cable TV, you've got MTV. Right. Did you know that MTV is in 75 countries, watched by 231 million households? Do you know that CNN, Cable News Network, is only watched by 100 million people? That music TV, that MTV, is watched by over, by over two times as many people? Now listen to this. According to the Barner Research Group, Christian young people are more likely to watch MTV during the past week, 42% than their non-Christian counterparts, 33%. This according to Contact, January 1995, reprinted in What in the World? Can you imagine? Christian young people watching MTV. You say, my kid doesn't watch MTV, how do you know? Well, they told me they don't watch it, how do you know? How do you know they're telling you the truth? How do you know what goes across your television screen when you're not there? Do you monitor it, tw monitor it 24 hours a day? Are you a fully, completely aware of everything that comes across the TV screen? The music business in this country produces $6.25 billion every year. Let me give it to you again. $6,000.255 million. $6.25 billion a year. That's a lot of Mercedes-Benz. That's a lot of yachts. That's a lot of money. Money is the bottom line to the music industry, right. Warner industry. Bob Dole, a presidential candidate just a few days ago, accused Time Warner of producing filth, of selling filth, of perverting the minds of the children of America, of putting the garbage out across MTV and across their, in their record sales, wherever it might be in this country, through the retail outlets, that Warner is making money by the millions, yea, billions, at the expense of young people. What, did he, what was his reply from Warner? What was his reply from Hollywood? What was his reply from the industry in America? They mocked him, they sneered at him, they made fun of him. Molly Ivins, a columnist, said this, quote, a lot of art is about sex and violence. Another quote, can't just tell genius to stay away from certain topics. You imagine this woman Molly Ivins saying that rock music, that the lyrics in rock music is genius? Just after the Oklahoma City bombing, when over 100 people were blown to bits in Oklahoma City, the President of the United States of America stood up before the American public and he said that radio talk shows and certain other groups across our country are permeating the, air, the airways with hate and they are creating an atmosphere of violence in this country and so therefore they should share in the responsibility of what happened in Oklahoma City. In one swoop of his mouth, he included everybody in this country that says anything that may not be agreeable with the political right, with the political, politically correct in America. And he condemned us all and put us all into one group. The President of the United States of America did not say one word about MTV. He did not say one word about Hollywood. He did not say one word about rap lyrics. He didn't say one word about rock lyrics. He had his guns aimed at talk show hosts. He had his guns aimed at the certain people in this country he wants to bring down. Truth has fallen in the street. Amen. The bottom line is that when a man says something in our country, he has an ulterior motive for it. There are very few people standing in the pulpits in America or standing in government positions throughout our land that say anything from pure moral motives. Amen. Most of the time a dollar bill is the driving force. Can I make money at this? Is there some way I can prosper? Or if he's a politician, can I make political hay out of it? And that's exactly what happened with Oklahoma City. That's exactly what was happening when this man said that. And that's exactly what's happening today. Imagine our kids. Who are they going to believe? Where do they turn? What do they do? Molly Ivins says, you cannot stop a great artist. 
These people are gifted, she says, referring to rock music, are they? Elton John sings, I'll think I'll buy a 45 and give them all a surprise. I think I'm gonna kill myself, cause a little suicide. They sing on, it's only the solution, it's the only solution left for you. Kill yourself, kill yourself. It's about time you tried, kill yourself, kill yourself. It's about time you died. Just a few weeks ago in the, in the, in the, in the park here in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, two young people pulled up there in their automobile. They'd made a pact to kill themselves. A park ranger confronted them. The young girl stood, jumped out of the car, took a shotgun, and blew herself into eternity. Before the young man could do anything, he still lives today. She's dead. They've made a suicide pact. Suicide among young people is one of the most horrendous things there is in this country. They're giving up hope on life. They've got problems, people. There are things bothering kids today, and it's high time we awakened and realized what was going on. Music, you so-called MTV music, so-called rap music, so-called rock music that's used today is damning their souls, poisoning their minds, and turning them against God and their family. You say it's music, you say it's art, you say we need to have it, we need to listen to it. I disagree. Metalika says, I've lost the will to live. Simply nothing more to give. There's nothing more for me. Need the end to make me free. And on he sings. Little Richard says, some rock groups stand in a circle and drink cups of blood. Then they kneel and pray to the devil. Gene Simmons, quote, I've always been interested in what human flesh tasted like. I've always wanted to be a cannibal. Well, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He'll think about it long enough until he tries it. No doubt he probably has already tried it. In the early hours of 1991, Seattle, Washington, a man was brutally beaten with a six-foot limb of a tree when they confronted the teenagers and said, why did you do this? Why did you beat this man to death? He was a seaman. He was a, a fellow who worked on the docks. He wasn't in the Navy, but he was simply a, a fellow that worked with the ships, and they didn't know him, and he didn't know them. But they took a six-foot limb, and they beat him to death. And then when he hit the ground, they took a rock and smashed his skull in, and they said, why did you do it? He's a perfect stranger. Why did you do it? They wouldn't answer why. But when they checked their car out, they found these tapes They're by a group called Death. One of the tapes entitled Left for Dead. The other one entitled Born Dead. The other one entitled Pull the Plug. The other one entitled Open Casket. You can't feed that into your mind without it start thinking, without start thinking of it in your heart. It comes into your mind and then it finds its way into your heart. Appearance one thing, but once it gets down in here, that's what you become. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's why thanks be unto God when you get saved by the grace of God. Your salvation is not up here. It's yeah, down here. Amen. Your heart is changed. Amen. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. Art? Is that truly art? Listen to what this woman says. Gladys Alicorn, a detective with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department in Florida, testifies that every teen she has interviewed in relation to the hate or occult crime has listened to black metal music and used hallucinogenic drugs. Police chiefs warned against occult crime, charisma, January 1991. Yes, sir. You say, well, that's the music of the kids. If they want to listen to it, let them listen to it. Yeah, they'll come out and kill you one day, too. Amen. They'll find your wife walking down the street one night alone. And they'll be listening and high on drugs and high on rock music, and she becomes their next victim just to watch her die. Beat them to death. You say, well, pretend. What's happening? I'll tell you what's happening. You either give the kids an alternative, you get involved with them, you give them the truth, you give them the word of God, you give them Christian music, Amen. or the devil will take them right out of your home. Amen. He'll take them, enslave them, and send them to hell. Amen. There is no middle ground. Madonna. How many ever heard of Madonna? Raise your hand. Amen. Dear sweet old Madonna. Madonna, described by Rolling Stone magazine as the most popular female vocalist of all time, has admitted, quote, I'm tormented. I have a lot of demons inside of me. My pain is as big as my joy. Los Angeles Times, May 5th, 1991. She has her own production company, Siren Films, and told a Rolling Stone interviewer, quote, you know what a siren is, don't you? A woman who draws men to their death. She claims that she has practiced sirendom. Rolling Stone, 1989, March 23rd. 
When asked if she feared death, she said, quote, yes. And added she feared going to the dark beyond. Madonna's got a lot of money. Madonna's got a lot of fans. If we had Madonna out here in some building in Knoxville, Tennessee, they'd pack it out. Oh, I guarantee you they'd sit in line for days to buy tickets to get in to see Madonna. David. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't stop the crowds from swelling around the building. And Madonna fears the unknown. She fears the darkness of death. She fears, she fears. A fellow by the name of Shui that preached in the revival meeting of evangelist said this. He said, if you fear God, you will fear nothing else. If you don't fear God, you will fear everything else. I thought that's a remarkable statement by that man, for that is very true. If you fear God, you fear nothing else. If you don't fear God, you fear everything. If you only knew the lives of these people, you'd realize what a wasted, wasted, wasted existence it is. Rock stars often die young. Do you know how many rock stars die before the age of 40? Do you know how many rock stars have gone off into a Christless eternity at a ripe old age of from 20 to 40? Many, many, many. Amen. We have a listing here of those who kill themselves. We have a listing of those who have been killed by others. We have a listing of those who have died in plane crashes. We have a listing of those who have died from drug overdoses. A listing of those who have died as, from alcoholism. And then a listing of those who have died from drownings. A remarkable thing. If I read all of this, it'd take too much time. A remarkable thing when you look at these people who are some of the richest people in America, and now they're dead. Why? Dead because of their connection with rock music. It's almost like the devil says, I'm going to use you so long. I only need you so long. And then when I get through with you, I'm through with you. And you're through for good. Amen. On Tuesday night, Johnny Polk preached about sex and promiscuity. He preached about purity. He preached about the need of young people to keep themselves pure Amen. till they come to the altar to be married and then live a life where they have lived, where they live a life of monogamy with each other, monogamous life of, of, of uh, where they, they leave this world alone and they live with each other for the rest of their lives. On Wednesday Amen. night, Gene Wolfenbarger preached a message about salvation and self-examination. This is the one that my dear brother mentioned just a moment ago, Daniel Cox because it was that message that brought the most conviction of the whole week. Gene Wolf and Margaret stood up before those young people who had been going to the altar. They'd been flocking in the altar. The altar call was given, the music was sung, and kids would come by the hundreds, literally by the hundreds, and fall across each other in this altar, and they would pray. Gene Wolf and Margaret stood up before those kids that night, and he said, I'm gonna tell you something, God's not impressed with your prayers. He's not impressed with your trips to the altar. Amen. He's not impressed with any religious show you put on here. You kids get up and go back to your seat and you're the same as you were when you went down to the front. He preached straight to those kids that night. I'll never forget the message that Gene Wolfenbarger preached to them and he said this. He said, examine yourselves. What do you be in the faith? Then he gave the illustration of the wheat and the tares. He talked about how that a wheat and a tare is identical until the time of harvest when one yields the fruit and the other cannot. When the time comes that the master says, come forth now and produce fruit, and the tare can produce no fruit. Amen. But until that time, he looks identical to the wheat. I'm afraid, my friend, we have tares at Temple Baptist Church. Amen. I'm afraid that we have tares in every church. Amen. I'm afraid that's our biggest problem in this hour. That is that there are so many people that talk like, look like, act like. They do everything that a Christian does, but they're not saved by the grace of God. Amen. When Gene Wolfram Ugger finished preaching that message that night, it was quiet. It was very quiet. You could hear a pen drop in that auditorium with 840, 840 plus teenagers. A huge auditorium, and yet it was just as quiet as it is in here right now. No noise whatsoever. He said, now I'm going to give you the opportunity to come down here and be saved. I'm going to give you the opportunity to move and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And move they did. Indeed, they moved. Those kids came that night and a different spirit came into that place that had not been there until then. That meeting changed that moment. From that moment on, the rest of the time we were at that meeting, it was different. Until that time, a certain spirit was there. But that night when those kids walked that aisle and fell on their face and had walked it over and over again, that night they came. And that night they examined themselves. And that night they came before the light of the Holy Word of God. That night they were saved. It changed, people. When you get saved by the grace of God, you're going to change. Amen. The Spirit's going to change. Everything's going to change. But until then, it's only show and make believe until you're born again by the grace of God. 
On Thursday night, David Ring preached. Dear Brother David Ring, who has cerebral palsy, who has a difficult time speaking, and you have to listen carefully to what he says. He preached that night about the stick of Moses that was cast down and became a serpent, and he picked it up by its tail, and it became a rod again. First it was the rod of Moses, and then it became rod, God's rod. What a great lesson he taught that night in that. A simple analogy is this. If you've got a gift, and that gift is your gift, you will never use that gift for the glory of God. But once you're yielded to the Son of the living God, that gift is the Lord's from that day on. Amen. And it's not yours any longer. Amen. And therefore you freely give of yourself to the Lord Jesus. Yeah. If this gift is keeping you away from God, if your talents and your abilities are dragging you further from the Lord because you love the praise of men, you love to be accepted of men, you want them to recognize you and who you are, it's your stick. Amen. But the day comes that you yield yourself completely to the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's God's stick. That's what we need at Temple. Amen. We need men and women in this church who aren't afraid to say, yes, if I have a talent, if I've got a gift, if I've got anything, whatever I am, I am by the grace of God. Amen. And you're not afraid to stand up and proclaim his name. But the greatest meeting of all wasn't Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. The greatest meeting of all is when we went back to our motel room Thursday night. And about midnight, we gathered together in a room. And there in that room at midnight, in that motel, these kids begin to open up. They begin to speak from their heart. We hadn't met before until that night to talk. And we'd gone through now four nights of preaching. And they'd seen the, they heard the preaching, they'd heard the music, and they'd seen what had happened, and some had been part of it. It was time now to open up, and my, how they opened up that night. Parents, I'm gonna tell you something. Your kids know what's going on in your homes. Your kids know what kind of parents they have. Your kids have fears, and your kids have problems, and your kids do suffer pain and your kids have needs. That night in that motel room, they begin to talk about moms and dads. They begin to talk about problems. They begin to talk about their fears. They started talking about things that hurt them and things that bothered them. And some of those kids that night began to pour out their soul and cry and weep. Some of them talked about things that have happened the past five years, ten years, things that go back a long way. But the bottom line is that they cleared themselves. They opened up their heart. They began to talk to each other. And the amazing thing is that our kids started reaching out and helping each other that night. They started comforting each other. I thought, what a remarkable thing this is. Some of these kids in here tonight that are comforting other kids don't have much. They have the same problems the other kids have, and yet they're able to reach out and comfort someone else. Amen. But that's the way it works. If you've been down that road and you know what it is to suffer on that road, then you know what it is to help the other fellow that's going down that road. Amen. If you've been in a life and you know what pain is, you know how somebody feels when they're, pain, when they're in pain. It's the fellow that lives in the ivory castle. It's the fellow that's never had any problems. He doesn't know what it means to comfort someone. That's why the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ walked down the same road you walked down so he can comfort you. He knows how you feel. He understands your soul. He knows what's in you. He knows what makes you tick. That night more was done in 30 minutes. More was done about an hour. I think it was from 12 o'clock and so. We met for about an hour, whatever it was. More was done in that period of time. Constructive, positive, real. Bonds were made. Things happened. Things were said that got things done that night. So quickly that I said to myself as I left that room that night, Lord, it took all that we had went through this week in camp just to prepare us for a little while where we began to open our hearts and talk about dads that aren't dads and moms that aren't moms and talk about things that happen that hurt and things that happen that cause problems. And you say, well, preacher, you've got me worried now. What, what did they say about me? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I mean, after all, when a child starts talking, we know who mom and dad is, don't we? I mean, they don't have to tell you who the mom and dad is. Well, what kind of parent are you, after all? I mean, really, what kind of parent are you? What kind of husband? What kind of wife? What kind of mother? What kind of father? And nothing, everything that was said was said in the open and was said for everybody to hear. And I'll tell you the truth. You talk of these faith healers, talk about releasing your faith. These, these, uh, these uh, charlatans talk about releasing the power of God. And what they mean by that is that there's some kind of a magical formula inside of you that once you tap into that, that, you're, that God's a big jack-in-the-box out there, and if you just know the magical formula, God's going to pop up any time you want him to, and you, he can do any, he'll do anything you want him to. That's releasing faith. That's a bunch of junk. Amen. But these kids did start releasing the power of God. Amen. They started releasing convicting power. Amen. 
They started releasing something that night. They really did. Something began to work that night after a year. Last year, our kids went to camp, came back, and they were on a big high. They were on a very high, emotional high. Our kids went to the altar time and time and time again last, last year. And they, on the van, coming back, they sang in such beautiful singing and, and how I enjoyed it. And when they got here, they were in such a high. I mean, you could tell these kids were just pumped up. They were fired up. But as always, emotions, Amen. if that's all it is, Amen. emotions waited for the big letdown. And it came. And when it came, they hit rock bottom. Amen. I mean, they hit hard. They hit rock bottom. You could see the devil working on them. You could see what they were going through. You prayed for them. And you wanted everything you can. And you get in there. What you do? What do you do, preacher? When this happens, I mean, you're faithful. That's what you do. What do you do when the, when the devil comes along to tie up the kids? You stay there with them. That's what you do. They have to have some stability. And some of them don't get it at home. I'm telling you, they don't get stability at home. They're looking for it. They're looking for somebody to take hold of and say, you're going to be here when I need you. I believe in you. That's what kids are looking for. They're looking Amen. for another kid that will cry with them and pray with them. Amen. And real with them. That's what they're looking for. Amen. We're not talking about babies. We're talking about young people who are going to be mature mothers and dads of their own in a few years. But they hit rock bottom. This year, they didn't come back like that. They came back more mature. They came back stronger. Amen. They came back with more cohesion. They came back more subtle. Well, they didn't grow up in a week. These kids didn't grow up in five days at Charlotte, North Carolina. They've been growing for a year. Amen. These kids didn't agree with everything that went on in camp. And they let you know they didn't agree with it. And I would stand back and I'd say, hallelujah, glory to God. Amen. Because they've got their own convictions. Amen. They know what they believe. There's a separation that takes place. A lot of those kids that went to camp this year, those youth leaders that took those kids to camp had taken kids that weren't saved, that had no training, probably right off the street. And that's good. That's all right. That's, they need to be under the Word of God. And they got saved. And thank God for that, folks. I'm not criticizing that. Not at all. I mean, where's the best place to take someone lost? Amen. Take them to church. Amen. But these kids had more stability. Now they're still growing. They're going to grow this year. They're going to grow next year. And I'm going to tell you something. They're going to pass some of you adults. They're going to pass you. They're going to leave you behind. They're going to continue to grow. And they're going to leave you behind. And that's a sad, sad thing. You can watch them grow in their singing, can't you? That's good singing, folks. I'm telling you, these kids can sing. And they'll get even better. Better. They'll, even, they'll get even closer to each other. They're building relationships with each other. Why? They clear themselves with each other. They talk to each other. They're not afraid to confess to each other. Are you understanding what I'm saying, adults? Amen. You start clearing with each other. Amen. You start confessing to each other. Amen. You start getting some of what these kids have got, and you're going to get a hold of what they've got. I'm Amen. telling you. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, he said, he said, for the self-same reason, verse number 11, he saw it after a godly sort. What carefulness and wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement and desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. And on the apostle goes. But bottom line is this simple statement. The kids have learned a secret that has, evil, that has simply evaded the adults. You're too mature. You've got too much of a face. You're too aloof. You're not about to open your heart up to anybody. You're not about. You're not about to. You've been hurt before. You've been hurt in the church. You've got this long path. You've got all this baggage. They don't have all that. Amen. It's so wonderful to look at fresh faith. Amen. God help us to nurture it. Work with it. Bless it. See that it grows and prospers. See that it spreads. If you would come into this altar this morning, clear yourself, open yourself, confess yourself, begin to be what you ought to be, you release the power of God into the Baptist church. You've only seen the beginning. Folks, I'm telling you, you've only seen the beginning.
again. God will do something in your life that you never thought possible. Amen. It's right at your doorstep. He's standing at your door and he's... Just let me in. That's all he wants. Amen. Come and do that. Amen. Come and do that. Clear yourself. Come right in. Amen. Are you ready for that? Father, in Jesus' name. Use what I've said. Somehow or another, Lord, put this together for these people. Speak to their heart with it, Lord. And draw them to this altar today. Oh, God. In Jesus' name. Help us. Help the young people. Help them to be honest and clear themselves with each other. Help them to confess. Lord, you've given these kids a, 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 a unique ability to discern. Our Father, hypocrisy too. They see it, and I know they see it. God, help them with this. Help them, Heavenly Father. Bless them, nurture them, see they grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And our Father, I pray for their parents this morning, for our mothers and fathers. God, we pray in Jesus' name they would see that name. Oh, God, we ask you that you be glorified in everything we do here. In thy name we pray. Amen.